presented by Peter Whip. Peter is a long range landholder, consultant and MCV climate champion for beef. Whilst Peter's example is with cattle, we are seeing similar results for sheep producers who we are working with. The concepts and ideas in Peter's talk are equally equivalent, uh, equally relevant, I should say, to sheep and cattle. Thank you, Peter. It's over to you. Thanks, Dave. Um, yeah, I'm Peter Whip. I'm a uh, beef producer near Longreach in uh, Western Queensland. We run about two to two and a half thousand head of cattle here on a uh, country that's mostly metro grass downs. Uh, we use um, Charolais bulls over our uh, main cows and we've got uh, Angus bulls over our uh, maiden heifers and I'll talk a little bit about why we do that in Western Queensland shortly. Um, yeah, I'm also a, a climate champion and uh, you may or may not have heard of that. It's a, it's a program that's been put together to encourage farmers to have input into the whole climate change debate. There's about 40 of us around Australia in all sorts of industries and uh, there's a couple of us in the beef side of it um, and there's a couple of sheep and wool growers as well. Um, the idea of the program is that we are meant to have input into um, the research, like to, to try and ground through some of the research that's going on and also and primarily probably into disseminating information back to our peers and, and other producers uh, just about what's happening with climate change and um, just with some of the research and, and some of the, the adaptation practices that are happening around the ridges. Um, why, why did I get into it? Um, as you know, most farmers have got shortage of time most of the time, but why get into it? Um, well, particularly for beef production, uh, um, Beef, in, in particular, has got a pretty big target on it when it comes to climate change, and uh, that's that's around, uh, particularly around methane emissions. And um, certainly, there's a lot of, you know, early on, there's been a lot of publicity, a lot of media hype about, um, you know, the impact of beef cattle production on on uh, methane emissions. And I sort of saw that as something that um, needed to be balanced, if possible, and and uh, to try and, you know, present maybe a, a more um, a more realistic view to some of the stuff that was out there. One thing in particular that hit me was, was a couple of surveys I saw where there was um, uh, universities that surveyed um, housewives that were looking at buying you know groceries and, and beef as part of it. And one of the big things was uh, um, there was a significant reduction in, in beef purchasing as a response to the climate change debate. And uh, obviously that's, that's our customers, that's our clients out there and uh, when they start changing things like that, that's a pretty significant um, issue for us. So yeah, that's the main reason why I wanted to to get involved and um, to try and play a part in it. But anyway, um, talking about climate change, now this photo that you're looking at in the background, um, I can tell you that Longreach certainly doesn't look like that at the moment. That's a photo uh, taken a year or two ago in, uh, in much better times and uh, j just on that on that um, idea, I guess, um, the idea of, of drought is certainly um, something that, hang on, I'm just going to get this. Hopefully I'll get the next slide to come up like it should. There we go. Right, so, so this is um, this is a map of Australia. Uh, you'll see there Longreach in, in Western Queensland, about in the middle of Queensland. You can see that, that for us, um, drought realistically is pretty much inevitable from time to time. So so really we have to consider that drought is, is a fact of life. It's not something that's never going to happen again. It's, it's going to happen with reasonably regular monotony. So um, where we are, we're in a generally in a re relatively low rainfall area, um, but the, the amount of rainfall is really not the issue. It's, it's the variability of that rainfall that really causes grief. And, and that's what we've seen over the last couple of years. You know, we can go from floods one year to droughts next year to, to something worse even the year after. So um, it's like the farmers in, in Western Queensland particularly, I mean, you know, they've been here for, for more than 100 years. So obviously over that time they've, they've learned to adapt in some way to to that variable climate, that variable uh, rainfall particularly, you know. So there's, there's certainly farmers that have been here long term and, and um, have adjusted to the challenges that that, that rainfall variability throws at us. Um, so while, you know, generally farmers out here are, are, are um, pretty accepting to say, yep, we have a variable rainfall, and might even say we have a, have a variable climate, but, but sometimes I guess there seems to be some resistance to the idea that that represents climate change. And, and fair enough, I, I don't have an issue with that. I mean, you know, we've all seen some interesting scientific developments that have, that have sort of been reversed.
burst over time after we've found a bit more information. So it's very hard for an average cocky out on, the, on, a, on a property to sort of to make a really clear cut decision about you know whether the science is, is all the answers or whether it's got a complete handle on this. But um, and I guess the other issue is that a lot of the issues around climate change that are being talked about, particularly in the media, are about long term effects. So the 30 to 50 year effects, you know, what will happen to sea level rises in, in 30 years or 50 years and, and uh, temperature changes over that time. And, and for most producers, you know, 30 to 50 years is, is a time frame that's very hard to get your head around. You know, normally we're looking at a time frame of maybe, you know, three to five years or uh, even up to 10 years. But probably even you know surviving the next drought you know those sort of time frames are what um, has a real significant impact on our business in our current sort of um, circumstances um, this, this you know so, so I guess it's uh, for a lot of producers it's hard to sort of accept that you know what do I need, what do I need to do that might uh, you know to cope with something that might happen in 50 years but um there is, have been changes around you know there, there's been some things that have already happened so these aren't um, you know, models, they aren't sort of someone's idea of what might happen in 30 years. This is actually recorded temperature change over the last 50 years. And um, this graph I've got up here is, it's been recorded at Birdsville, which is um, a bit further west than us, but there's sort of similar similar graphs for most western Queensland um, areas. Um, and, and this is a graph of the days over 35 degrees Celsius. And, and it's pretty clear cut, like it's pretty hard to argue with that graph to say that um, it hasn't that temperature hasn't risen. It, it's a clear trend there that there's been a significant rise in the number of days over 35 degrees over that 50-year uh, period. And, and why is that important? Why is 35 degrees important? Well, um, there's plenty of research out there that indicates once you get over temperatures around 30 degrees Celsius, um, dry matter intake uh, is significantly impacted. And uh, obviously, if you're in the beef industry and you're trying to put weight gain on as quickly as possible, you want cattle to eat grass. Um, as quickly as they can, or as much as they can, to to do to turn into production. So there's um, some some data around. So it's actually American data, but it suggests that um, yeah, significant impacts over 30 percent, and once you get over 40 percent, the dry matter intake can be reduced by up to 50 percent. Now, um, for example, last this last Christmas, our last summer, we had um, a string of days. There was 12 days in a row where the temperature stayed over 46 degrees. Um, most people, and certainly ourselves, saw that that 12-day period as equivalent to about an impact of about two months drought in, in the terms of what it did to our cattle and and their condition. And um, I'm you know I'm no scientist, but I certainly put that down to that that real impact of uh, a reduced dry matter intake, as well as uh, you know there's a number of things happening at that time. You generally your pasture quality and your quantities down. Uh, cows are starting to calve. Um, the temperature, you know, all of those things. That it, but um, I really think that that's something I hadn't seen in my years in Western Queensland, the impact like we saw last year. And uh, and yeah, a number of people that have been here long term sort of said the same thing, that just the impact of those extreme temperature events um, over those 12 days uh, yeah, really impacted on cattle condition and, and production. So I mean, that's things that are happening already, you know, and um, whether we can say, okay, that might be a cycle or whatever, but, but certainly whether it's a cycle or not, we still have to manage for it because it's happening and, um, and it has happened. So. What do we do to manage manage for that? Uh, um, I want to cover a couple of areas. Um, again, there's a nice uh, non-drought picture there for you to look at. Um, that's uh, not what Western Queensland looks like at the moment. Um, look, one of the first ones is infrastructure, and um, and this is something that probably in Western Queensland we haven't done very well in the past, and I think we're getting better at it. Um, particularly water water distances. Um, you know, we've had traditionally in the past, you know, big big paddocks with uh, a lot of distance between water. And um, certainly the data out there suggests that say an average beast uses about two megajoules of energy to walk a kilometre. That's just a function of walking, let alone anything else. So if um, you know we've got our waters, you know, five or six or seven kilometres apart and cattle walking in and out to water every day, I mean there's a significant amount of energy that's being burnt just in walking and that energy that's being burnt isn't going into production. So it's not going into milk for a calf or or weight gain for a steer. So um, that, that's something that we, we've focused on particularly trying to get that uh, water distance down certainly to less than two kilometres where we can. And I mean, you know, I know understand there's the significant, um, you know, costs in, in that sort of infrastructure. You know, um, you know, the public pipe we're running is probably about, you know, $4,000 a kilometre. And, uh, you know, we've just done another 10, uh, 10 kilometres, so there's 40,000 just for the pipe before you look at laying and pipe and 
uh, troughs and tanks and whatever. So significant costs there. But I think if we're looking at trying to to manage this, um, you know, even to manage for production, let alone for managed for increased temperature and um, extreme temperature events in the future, that's something we have to look at. Um, the other thing we've done in terms of infrastructure is, is increased fencing. Um, the place that we we were on now, was, we've only had about three and a half years, but it, um, we've done a fair bit of fencing here to try and just get paddocks into uh, smaller paddocks that we can rotate through and, and so that we can wet season spell country. Um, the way it was set up before was very hard to, to spell country because big paddocks, you ended up having to use them. So um, yeah, again, giving a dollars in fencing, but again, if it's something that you want to do, it's, it's uh, just necessary expense. And we're, we're looking at that rotational grazing to manage pasture quality and quantity. So it's um, well, wet season spelling, we, we firmly believe we're getting more, more uh, a greater volume of pasture plus the pasture better, better condition and better quality than what would be otherwise. Um, in Western Queensland here, um, you know, obviously our, we really only have a fairly short growing season compared to a lot of other areas. So, so we only get a wet season, you know, well, normally January, February, March at the most. And so our growth phase is only, sometimes it can be as short as a couple of weeks, but, but normally it's only a couple of months. Um, so what that means is our feed quality is pretty important, particularly later in the year once we get into sort of that spring. Uh, we know we're not going to get any green feed normally until, you know, January, February. So we've got that, that's a long haul there, that time from, from spring until it rains. So, so rotating and uh, wet season spelling, we try to use those to just to improve the quality of that pasture, so that um, yeah we can try and keep our production up as much as we can through that tough time. Um, management, uh, it's probably one of the other keys. Like uh, one of the key things that we you know feel is necessary is feed budgeting, and that's probably fairly obvious. I mean, you might be saying I'm not telling anything, and, and you're right, but um, feed budgeting is a bit like money budgeting. I mean, you've got to make your money work as hard as it can. But if you go over the line, well, you know, the bank's going to be knocking at your door and it's a bit like a feed budget, you know, you, you need to try and use as much of your feed as you can to obviously to maximise production. But if you step over the line and uh, and use too much, well, you all know where that ends up and particularly when you've got extremely variable rainfall um, like we do in Western Queensland. So that feed budgeting is a real key skill that, that um, I'm still still getting to perfect, that's for sure, and, and a lot of people, I think, um, you know, struggle with it a bit to try and maximise production at one, on one hand, but still uh, be sustainable on the other end. So it's something that we can always improve. Um, we've looked at um, our joining time. Traditionally, like we've, we've joined our cattle at the end of January um, for, for three months. Um, so that means that our calving starts at the end of October normally. Um, last year, that turned into a bit of a disaster because we didn't have any rain at all until um, late January. And, um, and even then, it was sort of like a one big dump of rain that probably, um, you know, wasn't ideal. So we've we've actually taken our joining time back a month later, um, which which can be a bit of a, a juggling act with your weaning time. Obviously, you want to try and wean before you get into that tough time in spring when when you're looking at a dry feed and your pasture quality going down. Um, but then, yeah, we're trying to put that calving back closer to when it might rain. So uh, it's something we were experimenting with. I don't know if it'll be right or wrong, but. Um, it's something we want to try and uh, and see how we go. The, um, the big thing with management, I guess, is is you're trying to achieve animal efficiency. So you're trying to, like any production system, if you're trying to make something, uh, you need that that production system to be as efficient as possible. Whether you've got a factory or you've got a property with cows or sheep on it, and um, that's what we're trying to do. Trying to convert grass to beef as as quickly and as cheaply as we can. And um, there is a bit of a a win-win in that, I think, in that um, if you can have an efficient production system, that normally means more money. Uh, so you're making more money, but there is a win-win that um, you generally require less grass to produce the same amount of beef. And from an emissions point of view, you're actually producing um, less emissions per kilo of a beef. And that's a term that um, emissions intensity is, is that term that means um, how much emission per kilo of beef. And that's a, a way of uh, measuring emissions efficiency. Um, obviously, you know, we, we could we could reduce emissions by just getting rid of you know a few million cows or a few million sheep or something like that. But practically, that's not an answer because we need to feed the world, and um, you know, if anything, we need to increase production to do that. So we need to look at that key key idea of, of emissions intensity. So we need to be as efficient with our production as we can, from both from a profit point of view and from an emissions point of view. Um, on that topic, like we've actually done a. We've done a study, um, we've been tied up with a study through with DAF in Queensland and uh, Melbourne Uni, and uh, what we're looking at is just modelling our production system that we're currently using um, against, say, you know, standard standard operations to see whether, 
Yeah, just see how it stacks up, I guess, is, is the main thing. Like we felt um, we'd made some decisions about our production system for profit reasons particularly and for efficiency from a uh, parts utilisation viewpoint. And um, there's definitely a spin, or we felt there was definitely a spin-off into that in terms of um, the emissions, uh, uh, the efficiency in terms of emissions intensity particularly. So uh, Melbourne Uni and DAF have looked at this and done some modelling. And this is just a summary, I guess, of the project or the key figures that we see anyway. Um, one of the big ones is, and actually anyway, from our profit point of view, um, the gross margin there is just about double, say, compared to a normal operation. Um, which, which you know, we need because we, you know, we're carrying a debt like everyone else, and uh, yeah, we want to be as profitable as we can. But the the other one that's interesting from an emissions point of view is that uh, emissions intensity there in those uh, that column, it's been reduced by about twenty four percent. So that's a significant reduction in emissions um, for our production system, and we're pretty happy about that. Um, one of the key things uh, we've done from a management point of view to achieve that is to look at. Um, a couple, a couple of key things. We talked about the infrastructure, but we need them, obviously. But um, we're looking at control mating, so we, we join our cows only for a short period, only for three months. Um, we're trying to match that joining period so that the cows are calving at a time when there's the maximum feed quality and quantity available. So, so when there's that peak sort of nutritional requirement for the cow, that hopefully that's our, our best time of the year in terms of feed. Um, we obviously preg test coal and that sort of thing, so we're really focusing on fertility, but, but one of the big things we've done, and, and for some of, if some of you guys are from, from southern areas, you'll, you won't think this is a revelation at all, but, but we made our heifers as yearlings, um, which I know in a lot of sort of southern areas, well, that's just a normal thing, but um, our yearlings in Western Queensland are probably around about 280 kilos, um, so a fair bit lighter than, than some of the southern ones, and, and generally a fair bit lighter than normally people would join. Now, we do that for a number of reasons, because we figure that, um, Maiden heifers are really the weakness in a, in, a, in a beef breeding business. Normally, if you look at a business and analyse how it's travelling, that'll be the weakness. It'll be around those heifers and, and their production because often you're carrying them for, for up to two years before you're joining them, so three years before they produce a calf. Um, so a significant feed requirement before we're actually making any money out of them. So we, we've taken the decision to, to look at this yearling mate, and we've been doing that for a number of years now. Um, that's why we use Angus bulls. I mean, normally you wouldn't pick black bulls to go into a into a um, climate where it's 46 degrees at Christmas time. But um, we've we've um, been using Angus Angus bulls from Hazeldean in um, in New South Wales, and we found they really stood up to that tough conditions pretty well. Um, so we're joining them as yearlings, joining them at about 280 kilos, and we're aiming for 70. pregnancy rates out of them and under normal years we've been doing better than that, like around so low 80s is, is what we've been doing, but we sort of aim for 70% to say that it's um, it's a viable option at 70%. Our normal cows we aim for about 85% um, conception in them or better, uh, and again, normally we do that. Now that I've told, uh, um, you know, we probably average about 55% across the whole herd and um, due primarily to, to weight, our cows will really light in condition. Um, heifers that did that we had joined and had weaned a calf off, you know, very light in condition coming back all that just because there was um, you know, very low feed availability at the end of the year and, and that real heat heat um, through January that really knocked them around and I think it well it'll take us, you know, another year or two to even get over there if we do get a season this year. So um, yeah, that, that sort of that last summer was a pretty tough one for us and it's our worst uh, performance record figures ever. And um, talking to a lot of other guys, um, you know, very similar. You know, we've had, we've seen guys that sort of normally pretty good operators, and they, they you know, got carving percentages down around thirty to forty percent. So um, that's a big hit. You know, whereas normally that'd be sort of eighty, eighty-five percent. Um, yeah. So, so with with our again coming back to our efficiency, because we're joining a lot of those heifers, so often they're up to about thirty percent of our females that we join each year, and they're at two hundred eighty kilos. So that obviously drags our average breeder weight way down. It's way down compared to the average. So if you were looking normally at, say, 450 to 500 kilo breeder weight, and then you throw in 30% of 280 kilos, you don't have to be a math genius to work out that, that that brings your average breeder weight back significantly. So you know cows eat a percentage of their body weight. Um, so obviously, we can run more cows for the same amount of grass doing that. And um, yeah, there's a link between the amount of grass consumed and um, the amount of emissions uh, put out. So that's partly where we pick up that um, reduction in emissions intensity. 
Um, and, and but overall, I guess the main reason we're looking at it is to be profitable, and uh, we we find that's the big hit of of doing that in our environment. It makes a big difference to our bottom line. So anyway, look, I've said enough. Um, just the, the key messages, I guess. And there's my wife with a couple of potty cars there. That um, not sure why they got into the talk, but I just thought that was a good photo to end on. Um, yeah, the key messages, I guess. I think for most farmers, most beef people in Western Queensland, anyway, we're trying to survive that medium term. I mean, certainly, you know, we're concerned about the long term, but but um, you know, we've got to we've got to survive this short to medium term first, and um, that's what we'll manage for first. Efficiency is the key, like both in terms of uh, profitability, grass utilisation, and emissions. Uh, if we're efficient at our breeding, at our beef production, we'll have efficiency across the board. So, and number three, we can actually have a win-win. Like it doesn't have to be mutually exclusive. You can actually manage for uh, reduced emissions and still have a productive and profitable business. So, um, look, thanks for listening, and um, hopefully, yeah, we'll have some questions and see how we go. Thanks. Okay, thanks very much for that, Peter. Um, very much appreciated. So if you do have questions you'd like answered um, by Peter in today's webinar, please type them into the question box. You'll see the question box on the right-hand side of your screen um, in the GoToWebinar toolbar. So just type them in there and um, I'll ask them to Peter. So first question we have here, Peter, is um, what are the reconception rates for your first calf cows? And are, the, are you rejoining the crossbred heifers? Yeah, okay. So the concept Reconception rates. Normally, um, so what, what we do, we manage our maiden heifers as a separate mob, so, so they're you know, obviously joined to Angus and then we sort of manage them separately. Um, once they have their first calf, then they go into the main breeder herd, so they're joined then to shallow bulls. And, um, and like I said, normally we, we would average you know, 80 to 85% conception rate out of them. Um, and what we're finding is those second calf heifers, uh, under normal gear, you're getting that same sort of conception rate through. Um, what we tend to find is, you know, we have done it in the past, like, the, you know, we've actually kept some heifers that didn't get in calf as a yearling and then rejoined them and, and there seems to be this sort of trend that says, you know, if they don't get in calf for, at the first year, well, their conception rate at second is not that flash either. But um, the big rider on that is you get a year like we just had and, um, you know, we, we had um, we had those made and so they would be number two heifers that we weaned the calf off this year. Um, some of their weights were, um, you know, well, I'm embarrassed to say it, but they were probably down around 300 kilos. So your reconception rate on something like that is going to be disastrous pretty much, and it probably it would have been, I think, under 50% for those in, in that sort of year. Um, but, but at the same token, our, our main cows only did about 55% anyway. Um, so, yeah, I think um, we're pretty happy with our reconstruction rates, and that's certainly a question that everyone asks, you know, to say, well, okay, you can get them in calf the first year, but how do they go the second year? Um, we don't have any dramas with that. In fact, um, look, we tend to find our our, mate, our yearling heifers, like they grow really well, okay, we join them at 280 kilos, say, at, um, at January, but, but that's our wet season. By the end of the wet, normally they've had three months of absolutely beautiful feed. Normally they'll be yellow would be probably nearly 400 kilos by the end of that wet so they're putting on a kilo a day over that period. So while it sounds scary to be joining some of the 280 kilos, by the end of that joining period they're close to 400 kilos and okay, our, our number three heifers that are pregnant now, they're probably the best looking cattle on the place at the moment. Um, so yeah, look, normally not an issue but obviously you have a big temperature and rainfall crash like we did this last summer and everything suffers and, and they're no exception. Um, yeah, in terms of rejoining the crossbreds, so so yeah, like we we normally will join all our all our heifers unless there's something obvious, you know, like a real temperament or or um, something like that. Um, so yeah, we'll normally rejoin all of them. We are getting to a point because um, we started with a with a cow herd of, of everything. Yeah, you know, we sort of built up from nothing, and so we had Brahmins and bits and pieces of everything. Um, we will get to a stage where we'll have to probably look at crossing back to something like at the moment we're using obviously European, you know, Angus and then Charolais. So um, we're going to end up with cattle that probably need to be crossed back to something else a bit later on and we're looking at a few options for that. Very good. There's a second bit to that question as well, Peter, and it was, um, so if you are um, redrawing across with heifers, if so, how do the conception rates compare with your higher boss indigo based heifers? Yeah, well, look, look, um, we don't have a lot of sort of straight Brahmin cattle left, you know, like we've got a few that we bought in at different times and that sort of thing. Um, so most of our heifers now would be, would have
have a fair bit of uh, boss tourists in them. You know, like um, we would normally, yeah, I don't think I'd have a straight Brahmin heifer left now. Um, we've got some certainly cows, um, Brahmin cows left, but um, no, we, we're we pretty happy with the conception rates across the board. And even, you know, like, like this last year was a tough year, I've said that a number of times, and like um, just as many Brahmin, if more Brahmins fell out of the system than crossbred did, you know. So normally, you know, I'm not trying to have the whole, you know, Brahmin versus crossbred debate, but, um, you know, normally Brahmin's got a, a reputation of handling a tough time better than crossbred, but certainly in what we told as empties, um, there'd be half and half, no worries at all. So I'm not, I'm sort of, I'm happy with, I don't really mind what, what, what breed we have as long as it's getting pregnant and having a calf, you know. Very good. And as David Phelps mentioned earlier, there has been work, there is work, um, currently occurring with sheep producers, and there's a similar message coming out of out of that work. So hopefully, in the coming coming months or, or next year, we'll be able to do another webinar with the sheep producers that are involved and, and see what messages are coming out of there. Um, another question for you, Peter: What past management did you change to complement the breeding aims? Um, yeah, a couple, couple of things. Like like one of the the major things we we. Um, we started. We only started about 14, 15 years ago, and um, bought a little block. And um, you know, we were trying to build our numbers up. So we had all breeders. Like, so we filled the place that we had at the time with all with breeders. And and I mean, what we found was as soon as you hit a tough time, that you know really put you under pressure because you had, you know, you generally had a whole place full of cows that were calving or pre tested cows or something like that, and you really had you know, options, in, not, not many options in terms of, you know, getting rid of cattle and that sort of thing. So um, as we've sort of got more country and more cattle, we've tried to, um, you know, just build in a bit of a buffer there in terms of, you know, we, we probably, uh, we go all our steers out to feed the steers now and so we've got a fair sort of buffer there if we have to go and, and say, take them out as weaners, for example, that'll give us a bit more grass for the cows and that sort of thing. And, and we always try and keep a bit of country that if we don't use it, it's up our sleeve to lease or adjust or something like that, so that we, we're trying to maintain a little bit of a buffer to handle these these sort of you know the variability in the rainfall. That's probably one of the big things we've changed. I've always been a fan of um, you know trying to uh, increase production through well certainly the infrastructure we talked about, but um, you know the control mating and trying to match that um, the, the the peak nutritional requirement to the peak pasture production. That's always been something I'm pretty been pretty keen on. Um, so, so not a lot of changes. We're probably refining things more than changing big things. Like, um, yeah, we, we did go through the phase of trying to run big numbers in mobs, and I'm not. I'm, I think that's a great idea, um, but it just didn't suit us at all. We've sort of backed away from that a fair bit. Um, so we, we run sort of smaller numbers, like you know, probably cow, like no more than about 300 cows in a mob now, um, and and that's well. There's a lot of reasons for that, but the main one probably is the, the short growing season. You know, we tend to and this year was a classic. Like we did get some grass from that January, February rain, um, but it dried off really quickly. So, um, you know, we had one big mob still floating around and, and we found that we lost a lot of feed with that big mob because the feed dried out so quickly and it was uh, really fragile. And so compared to, say, where we had smaller mobs on the other side of the place, like we probably got better value out of their feed with the smaller mobs. I mean, I'll, as I said, I'm not knocking that idea, but um, that's something we certainly changed. We, we won't go back to that bigger mob concept. So. Okay, great. Um, I'd just like to also mention that there is a small uh, survey we'd like you to complete um, before you leave the webinar. So you'll see the link to that in your question box. So before you do leave, if you, if you just click on that link, we'd really appreciate your feedback on today's webinar. So the next question we've got here, Peter, for you is, uh, what effect does early weaning have on emission intensity? Early weaning, yeah. Um, like uh, in terms of what like we normally wean everything um, before the spring, so we normally wean in July. Um, so most of our weaners at that stage will be sort of four to six months old. Um, we're trying to get them off the cow uh, to give the cow the best chance of, of raising the next calf, if you like, and um, and also you know gives us options about whether we need to you know like we normally feed a, a sort of a um, protein supplement to those weaners um, to keep them ticking along until their own. Um, in terms of emissions uh, intensity, look, I think, again, I'm not a scientist, but certainly um, from what I see, uh, if, if, if you can make that system as efficient as possible, that means your emissions are as low as possible. So what we're trying to do is 
keep that cow in reasonable condition so she can raise the next calf without having to hold her any extra year or have any gaps in that production system. So we're trying to just keep that continuous breeding sort of program going. So by, by pulling the wean off early, that allows that cow to maintain the next calf, get back in calf. Um, and so we're really focusing on her production to, to keep her ticking along without having big gaps that, that where we're eating grass, making emissions without actually making any more beef. Um, so that's probably, you know, again, I, I couldn't put a figure on it in terms of that, but, but certainly from our point of view, um, we've focused on, on keeping that production system going at all times. So every animal is either pregnant and, and raising, you know, bringing a calf in terms of production or, or putting weight gain on. So, um, yeah, that's how I look at that. Okay. Next question is, um, you may not be able to put a figure on this, but you can maybe add some comments to it. How much supplement is needed for improved live weights? Is this affected by pasture management? So how much supplement is, uh, is needed? Yes, that's the question, yep. yep. Yeah, well, look, um, look I, we, we don't feed, say, molasses or anything like that. We, we, we normally just feed a protein mix. So we, our cows are on a 30% um, urea uh, loose mix, loose lick, um, and that's normally we feed that normally from, oh, well, it varies any, but normally from about the middle of the year until it rains, depending on the season, that sort of thing. Um, and that's that's a pretty basic sort of lick. It's, it's got nothing fancy. There's a bit of cottonseed meal and that sort of thing, but it's just a basic, it's more for protein. Um, and we, if they get a, a, another mix, which is a bit different, it's a, it's about an 8% uh, urea, but, but with a bit more um, cottonseed meal and things like that in it. Uh, again, it, it's really, we're focused on protein because normally in our environment, that's our, our normally our weakest link. So, um, what we'd love to be really cost-benefit and, and we figure most years um, we were able to still have a, a reasonable level of production without that. Um, last year I would probably have loved to have molasses because it was there, there was a crash and, and it would have helped a lot I think in that sort of short-term period. But, but um, yeah, look, in terms of supplement, um, most of the kids are eating about 200 grand a day. Um, that's around about $650 a ton. Um, and, and they're getting, so they're getting about 60 grams of urea a day and, and yeah, they're getting enough protein from that um, as long as you've got grass obviously to go with it. So so we're not looking at a big, big supplement program, um, just basically and um, yeah, that's all it is. Okay, great. I'd just also like to mention to everyone that today's webinar is being recorded and is available, will be available on the Leading Sheep website, which is www leadingsheep.com.au. The next question for you, Peter, is do you use grass budgets to adjust your stocking rate to match the grass supply? Yeah, look, look, that, that is key. You know, as I said, look, we're not, I'm certainly not a guru of that principle trial. We, we, we do really put a lot of effort into this because I, figured it, I really figure it's key. Um, one of the dramas we got um, where we are, we've got a fair bit of timber in our country, like along channels and even some of the other grass has got a fair bit of worry and that sort of thing through it. And, and roos are really done. No, we have big hockey wins in our roos, but we really, really are a drama for us. And um, I've, I think that we turned 20% of our feed this year, because we have a feed budget after the end of the wet season, working on what sort of volume we had, and then we've been doing them sort of ongoing as, as the season's gone on. And, you know, yeah, we figure we've lost probably 20% of our feed to roos. And, and, I mean, we've got a few feral goats and a few feral sheep as well. That's another whole issue. But, um, we, we've lost there, about 20 percent. We've had paddocks that we've spilled all year and really, you know, we put the cattle into them now and they're basically, you know, we're probably going to get a couple of weeks out of them, you know, because they're, they're just about had it. So um, feed budget critical. Um, really learned my lesson last year. We, we sold a place last year and I did my feed budget and and was, was short on the feed budget but sort of thought, oh, I'll just take a punt because when it rains the cattle will be worth a lot of money and you know, and, and obviously as everyone knows it didn't really rain and the cattle weren't worth a lot of money and um, yeah, and, and yeah, our production figures are just equal to it. So look, I, I just, I think it would nearly be the most important thing for a grazier in Western Queensland to get right would be that feed budget. Um, you know, a lot of the other stuff I've been talking about, very good, but if you don't get that feed budget right, well, you're either going to miss out on production because you're going to be way understocked or you're going to cause dramas at the other end of the line So it's, it's probably the key to correct for Western Queensland guys, yeah. Great. Um, the next question we have here, are there other strategies for managing heat besides water? Do the 
do the increased water, watering points improve pasture utilisation regardless of paddock sizes? Yeah, well the last one's easy. Um, yeah, they do definitely do. The increased water definitely with a lot better utilisation. We're running a lot more cattle here than ever on this place. You know, when we bought this place it was running about 300 cows and we're running, you know, we're doing two and two and a half thousand now. So I mean, obviously, you know, we really um, ramped up that, that pasture utilisation and um, yeah, it makes a huge difference. And even in terms of, um, you know, in the past a lot of wars were open dams, so, you know, and particularly at times of the year, you've got cattle, cattle at a week down in open dams, we'll have to do the recipe for disaster. So, um, yeah, definitely pot, well, we've popped, I think, about 30, 40 k's of polypop since we've been here, and a lot of troughs tanks, you know, that's made a huge difference to to managing drought, definitely, you know, so you don't have cattle walking into dams and all that sort of stuff, and you've got better quality water and, and the water's closer. Definitely that's all easy. Um, heat, managing heat, look, I wish I had a good answer for that. Um, yeah, we, we, we're probably, in some ways, we're better off than a lot of guys. We've got a lot of shade on our place where we are now. Um, the place we saw last year was probably a little bit more open, and, and certainly that was something that we thought about when we were looking at selling it. Um, I, I don't have an answer. Look, I mean, you know, we would love someone smart to come up with an answer for that. Like at the moment, we've, by doing water, um, you know, trying to, you know, have cattle in then paddocks that are more shaded in those worst time of the year. Um, maybe maybe that's where a supplement of some sort comes in. You know, maybe we will need to go to like a, a short-term molasses supplement for those really extreme um, temperature events. You know, that, that still, even though the dry matter intake, maybe we can maintain an energy input with something like that. I, I, I really haven't got an answer. I'd love someone to come up with one, but um, yeah, no, I don't know, other than what we're doing, you know. Thanks for that, Peter. And we've got one last question here that we'll, I'll ask is, uh, is growth hormone something that is an option for you to increase kilograms of production for the same energy intake? Yeah, look, that's a tough question. It, it, it could be like, like, I'm just a bit personally, I mean, I know it's, you know, all the science is there and says it's okay and whatever, but like, I know myself, if I'm going to eat something and you gave me the option of something that had hormones in it and something that didn't, and, and without probably there being any basis scientifically or whatever, I picked the one that had no hormones, and, and that's a decision we've made. So I'm off by both of us that way, and, and it's probably a line we might not stop up and step over. I'll probably, I'll certainly, yeah, scientists would probably say, yeah, there's no, no reason not to do it. But um, it's just something, I suppose, that we probably believe in. I mean, if we're going to sell our beef to customers, we wouldn't want to sell something to someone that we would need ourselves, and so I guess that's the answer to that question. I mean, yep, could could well make a difference to production, but it's probably something that we'll we won't do. Well, it's something we won't do because of just what we believe. Very good. So, so that's all the questions we've got um, for today's webinar. So I just thought like to thank you for your time um, in preparing this and, and presenting it today to us. It's really much appreciated. Um, and we, yeah, we value your information. It's been very informative for all of us. Um, I'd also like to thank David Phelps for helping bring to the, together these series of webinars. Um, they've been very successful and hopefully, as I said, we can run another one in the future um, with some more sheep oriented information. So that has been great. Um, I'd just also like to thank the Make More From Sheep Project, which has hosted these webinars and brought them to you. Uh, and the support from the Future Beef and the Leading Sheep Project as well.